you know, but I did that before we jumped on. So let's get started. Uh, cool. We have super fun. You all can see that. And uh, people on Zoom, can you confirm that you uh, you can see the slides? All right, thank you. All right, I missed you all. That's uh, the first thing I'll say, although we interacted a lot over Zoom, so I wasn't too far, or I mean, uh, through Discord, so I wasn't too far away. Uh, cool, now we, that you've learned a ton, we're gonna turn our attention to network security. So this is uh, actually one of my favorite uh, topics uh, that we cover in this course. Uh, because we really get to kind of peel back the curtain and actually learn how networking works right which is something that is integral to our lives right so there's people who are right now listening on zoom and so the question in your mind actually as a computer scientist in general and as a curious person would be well how does that work right you know that there's computers involved you know that somehow the data my voice packets the video packet here is coming from my computer right here and then beaming to the 40 you no know, 60 some odd people who are on zoom right now right that has to happen somehow and that data has to go over the internet traverse networks that i have no idea about i don't have any control over of what direction it goes and so um there's really interesting uh concepts here about how that actually happens so this uh in case you are i don't know what week is this the week before spring break let's say um seventh or something like that yeah so it's like the seventh week so you shouldn't be surprised if this is not a networking course uh, but we are going to cover networking so we're going to go at the depth that is necessary to understand the security implications so that you will fully understand when somebody tells you or when you tell somebody else why it's a bad idea to connect to an unsecured wi-fi network you'll actually be able to say exactly why that that is a bad uh, a bad thing to do uh, and unsecured we mean something without a password and we're not just going to understand this at a theoretical level we're going to study the protocols involved at all the almost all the layers of the networking stack so that we can see what attacks we can do and what attacks an attacker can do at those levels so uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here this involves kind of learning how networking works so that we can break stuff uh, any questions before i get started on either here or on zoom Sweet. All right, let's jump off. So we first start with uh, IP. So the um, we're going to talk about this as a suite. As we'll see, there's actually a number of different protocols at all different layers of the of the uh, stack. And actually, one of the things that I want to develop as we're going and as we're studying these things, and this is the things that help you when you're learning things right when you're learning some kind of protocol and they say oh they have the bits are here and these bits are here you should ask yourself why right some human had to design this protocol why is it the way it is and so i'll try to point out as we go through some of the things why certain things are the way they are and what the benefits and drawbacks of those approaches are uh, sometimes the drawbacks they never thought about because as we'll see a lot of these protocols were done in like the 70s um, and 80s before we were even thinking about security, so there's a lot of security implications, but there's also a lot of good design decisions that went into these things, and you can apply these to uh, other aspects of your career. So that's why it's really important to think about these. So we're going to think about the entire, so we'll call it the Internet Protocol Suite Stack, all different types of names. Um, basically, the set of protocols that's used to transport data from between different nodes on a network. So this actually kind of... Um, brings up an interesting question so yeah the point of these networking protocols is to transmit data between different basically computing systems so why am i saying like a super broad computing systems not just like computers yeah it includes routers and switches and your uh wi-fi uh thing at home there's i mean i'm connected to wi-fi right now there's probably one, if not multiple in this room, because it's a 438 person capacity. So maybe you'd want two router. I actually don't have no idea how they do that, but there's definitely some Wi Fi router somewhere here that my packets are going to. That's figuring out where to send it to within ASU. 
And then ASU needs to figure out how to get it to Zoom and so on and so forth until it find, that data finally gets uh, to where it needs to go. So because of that, there's a lot of different things that need to happen there, right? There needs to be, uh, we need to have some way to transmit that data, like the actual video frames and whatever, which are encoded themselves in their own different protocols. But beyond that, I need a way, like there needs to be, there's a Wi-Fi standard of how the Wi-Fi devices talk. I actually know very little about like wireless networking. So I don't know much about how that works, but, and all these different, uh, what are we up to? Is it like AG or AN, or I don't even know the latest uh, standards, but there's a lot of them to shoot data super quickly um, across this. Um, cool. So we're gonna look at that. And the other thing this is also called like the TCP IP stack. We'll kind of see these form kind of the core protocols, but there's a lot of different um, aspects here. And one of the key design principles that I want you to be thinking about is this notion of abstraction and encapsulation. And that's actually why we're going to be looking at it and why people think about it in terms of these different layers where you have the essentially, so there's a, the physical layer of how the data gets from me to the router, which is done with wireless, but then there's how does my machine know to even talk to that wireless router? How does it know, like if I'm just shooting data into the air, how does your computer know that it's not meant for you and this router knows that it's meant for it? Um, that's a different layer. And then the layer on top of that is basically how do I get data to Zoom or to whoever it's ultimately going to? And the key thing here, and this is again, another key security principle, is you always wanna look for these places where the abstractions break down. So as we'll see, it's not this beautiful model that maybe if you've taken networking or will take, they, they teach you about, there's actually some bleeding between the layers and that actually causes security problems uh, as we'll see. So, uh, so yeah, we start with kind of the link layer. So there's uh, physical protocols are the lowest layer. Uh, then link layer protocols, which we'll talk about, uh, internet protocols. So what's the difference between an internet and an intranet? Yeah, so uh, Zoom is uh, saying, yeah, so an intranet is like a local network, right? If you own, think about it this way, right? If you're ASU, you own all the routers, all the computers, whatever, you can make whatever kind of crazy networking scheme you want inside. The problem is when you try to talk externally, when you need different organizations to talk to each other, that's why how we actually came about the internet. This is the internet is a um, connection of intranets, basically. So each local internet does things their own way. Now it becomes comes a lot easier rather than translating whatever you talk to somebody else into some different protocol. Um, you it's a lot easier if you run the same thing that the internet kind of runs on so um we'll look at that so is bluetooth considered an intranet interesting uh yeah i mean i actually don't know all the specifics about how bluetooth works in terms of networking i think it's more of a point-to-point -point communication like a link layer of how you make a connection but a personal area network? Yeah, I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, exactly. maybe maybe it's like a local network just based around those Bluetooth devices. So maybe it has some, I think the key difference there is in an intranet, you can get information in the same protocol to different machines inside one intranet. But I'd say there, if it's just like a hub and spoke, like a bunch of things connected to one thing and they can all talk to each other, that's not quite the same as being able to pass data between other systems. Um, cool. And uh, we'll look at transport protocols. So how do we send data? Uh, one of, what's one of the key problems that, that can exist or that you may have faced when using the internet or sending data on the internet? Is everything always fine? Are you just like very happy with your internet connection? Have you ever been on a Zoom call where the person's like, you know, audio dropped or video messed up? lag i can see the gamers in the chat talking about lag yeah why why is that a problem why does that even happen we made all this stuff right shouldn't it just work louder please there's a lot of factors like breaking up like two microphone protocol 
Yeah, there's a lot. We don't know. We don't control exactly what physical route the data is taking. And therefore, we have no idea of what kind of physical things it's going to happen, right? Like literally, data is flowing through the air and the wireless to this wireless router. Somebody could be jamming me in this class. They could be sending a lot of signals to break up my connection there. Um, it could be environmental concerns. Uh, actually, I read a, um, I think it was a paper or blog post a while back that was talking about one of the most common causes of uh, internet outages is squirrels because they end up like chewing on some of the lines and then um, I would assume the squirrels die at some point, but uh, I don't know exactly uh, the physics there, but eventually like squirrels actually ruin uh, internet or another paper I saw uh, looked at the correlation between the weather and internet outages. And they found of course, which seems intuitive, but when there's a big storm and everything, actually there's a lot of internet problems, right? So all of these things, your, your data is traversing these systems that you know nothing about, you don't control. Somebody could literally just go and like cut the, the link that your computers are using to connect. Um, and so how do we get this data out there? How do we deal with this kind of uncertain um, conditions? So these are the, the super interesting things there. Um, somebody is claiming that that's just service providers pointing fingers. Uh, I've Heard this from other non uh, ISP sources. So, and then we have at the highest level application protocols. So, what are some of the common applications that you use on the internet? Google? That's too high level. That's uh, something that runs on the internet. What does uh, Google use? How do you talk to Google? Say it again. Your web browser, what's your web browser use? What was it? Yeah, that's what specific browser? What's the protocol that it's actually using to talk to google.com? Yeah, HTTPS or HTTP, right? So those are, and the web. So the web is actually, so this is one of the um, key things that if you learn this distinction will make you seem, uh, much more informed about things. So a lot of people conflate the web and the internet. So what's the difference between the two? Close, close. Yeah, so uh, domain names factor into it, although not quite, they're not exclusive to the web. What, let's think about it this way. What are some non-web application protocols that you've maybe used on the internet or that you've heard about? Spotify. Spotify probably uses the web, although I don't know that for certain. Ah, there we go. Uh, SMTP, anybody ever send an email? Yeah, so simple mail transport protocol, SMTP is the way that your mail goes from computer to computer. That's absolutely nothing to do with the web. And it actually predates the web. Uh, the web was actually, I think we'll go into it, but the web was actually created in 91 at CERN and the internet was around like in the seventies and eighties. So they had, um, they had email way before uh, they ever had um, the web. It was the wait what on the age of the web? On the Zoom chat. Yes. Yeah, the web it was only created in the early 90s. So uh, it started at CERN. So what does CERN do? C-E-R-N. There's nobody here who's ever taken a physics class or physics, interested in physics, CERN. Yeah. Yeah, it's a particle physics collider or something. I actually have no idea what the acronym stands for, right? And so uh, basically they're trying to like slam particles together to see what happens, I guess. Like, I don't know, I'm not a physicist, but uh, I know at least at that level. And so um, what they have to do is they had a bunch of people who would continually rotate in and out of the company. And so one of the engineers that are one of the, I guess he wasn't an engineer. Um, don't remember his exact job there, but he was working at CERN, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, 
And he realized like, oh, it'd be great if we had a way to like list people and offices and phone numbers. And he had been keeping track of some things like hypertext where you could like, each document could have links to other documents and you could follow those documents and you could edit things. And so he literally invented uh, HTTP, HTML and like URLs, uh, URIs so that um, they could do that there in CERN. And it actually took off like wildfire and became literally the web that we know today is based all on that stuff. So it was insane. Like, I think he created the first ones in like 91, 92. And like by 94, 95, we had like major web browsers and we had like uh, more of the early web. So anyways, cool. Uh, yeah. All right, so yeah, anyways, lots of different applications. So that's one of the key things to, to realize and we'll talk about some of them, right? You've actually used them, uh, probably some of you in, when using the uh, pwn.cse365.io. How do some of you remotely access that system? With what? SSH. Yeah, with SSH. SSH is a complete, has not, it predates again the web. It's a protocol that has nothing to do with the web. It's how you access a remote system. Um, and so, it uses a different protocol than websites use to transmit data. All right, so let's take a look at the stack. So at the bottom, we have the physical layer. So this is what's used physically to transmit data. If you're on wireless, this would be the Wi-Fi, whatever, whatever. If you're on Ethernet, it would be whatever Ethernet uses to send data. There's actually, you know, you can make an entire career out of optimizing this layer, right? You got to think about where do we get all these new advanced advances in uh, Wi-Fi? What's from people who study these things, make the things more efficient, make them, uh, you also have to deal with multiple people talking at one time. And anyways, there's a lot of uh, things there. Then above that, we have the link layer. So this layer is what, um, sits on top of the physical layer and it's what says, okay, I'd like to send this information to this specific machine on my local network. And we'll get into really in depth what the difference is between local and remote here and exactly what they uh, means. How many layers are there? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. It uh, depends on exactly which um, model you're using. I've heard some people use seven, some people use five. We're gonna use five here. Um, so then above the link layer, you have the internet level. So the link is basically, how do I get data to a system that's local to me, that I have a direct communication with, or direct for some notion of direct. Um, then above that is IP. So the internet level says, how do I get that data to Zoom, right? My ultimate location. Zoom does not exist in my local network. So how do I get it to someplace far away from me? Then above that, we have the transport layer. So these, the two classic examples of here are TCP and UDP, two different protocols. Um, it's really important to understand these and how they work. And finally, we have the application level at the top. So HTTP, again, is just one of the types of applications that run on and use the TCP IP stack. SMTP, we talked about, the simple mail transport protocol. Uh, DNS, the domain name service, I think. This is what is used to translate google.com into an actual internet protocol address so that you can talk to it. If you didn't have that, we'd have to memorize like 32-bit numbers to access websites, which would be insanely difficult. But the really cool thing is it's not something special. It actually is, uses this whole mechanism. So you use a one protocol, TC, uh, DNS, in order to resolve and translate a domain name into something, an IP address that the machines can use and then they use that to then make a connection. Uh, NFS, anybody ever mess with NS NFS? Or know what it is or stands for? What was that? Uh, network file system. Uh, yeah, so this is when you wanna like share files between machines. If you run like a home uh, NAS or something like that, you can expose it as a network file share. If you uh, run Linux and use Samba, Samba is, and SMB are like, I think they're related to NFS. I actually don't know what the precise differences are. 
questions about this level? Yeah, SMB is what Windows uses. I think it's based on NFS or something like that. It's very similar, but anyways. No questions? Everything's crystal clear? Uh -huh. Louder? The physical layer or, or higher up? I think this depends a lot. So we'll see. Basically, the way I think about it is this link layer provides a, um, as we'll see, provides a standard interface to send data from one machine to another on the same local network. So how it does that with the physical layer is up to whatever this physical layer is. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. There's, um, I think one of the older ones was a token ring network. So the idea was uh, switches were super expensive and difficult to do. So what you do is connect each machine in your network one to the other. So each machine would essentially have one, I don't know if it's ethernet or coaxial or whatever, but one physical in and one physical out to the next machine. And when you wanted to send a packet, you would just send it out on your out. It would go to the next machine and keep going around. Everyone takes it, looks, is this for me? Nope, passes it off to the next person in the ring. And so you can see that's like insanely inefficient way of doing something. But uh, when you have limitations based on, you don't really have switches and those kinds of things, uh, it can actually can work. Um, so this is why like, the the link layer works exactly the same whatever kind of crazy scheme you have at the physical layer and so we'll see it's actually as a standard way of saying oh is this packet for me or not um and then we'll look at so the already in this diagram we actually have some bleeding between the two and we'll see this so there's uh we'll get into ARP. so the address resolution protocol this translates between IP and the link layer. As we'll see, there's different addresses at both. Uh, and you may know, oh, I wanna to talk to this IP address, but you don't know the link address on your local network. And so we'll look at that. Uh, our ARP is the reverse. Like I have this uh, link address, I wanna translate it to an IP address. Those are protocols for each. Um, let's see, other things here, ICMP. Anyone ever use the ping command? The test if something's up, yeah. So I'll, I'll show that off later, but um, this is basically, this is using a specific ICMP message that says, hey, please send this back to me. That's actually built in for network debugging. <laughs> the reason why you learned how to use the console, yeah. You mean besides this class. Cool. So let's dig in. So we first have to start with addresses. Why? So the goal here is to be able to transmit data from any one machine to any other machine. But there's one piece, important, super important piece of information we need to know. The other thing I like to think about is um, the post office. Anybody actually physically write a letter? Anybody actually get mail? Or you all, I don't know the shoe, digital mail. What do you have to do to actually send a letter to somebody in the United States? You need to put a stamp on it, so you need to pay for it. What else? You write the address. Why do you need to do that? I don't need to know where it's going. Who needs to know where it's going? The post office needs to know where it's going, right? They need to know, how do I physically get this letter from us here in, in Tempe at the Tempe post office and how do I get it wherever it's going? Uh, St. Louis, wherever, right? Um, do you even need necessarily a name? What's actually required? So if you don't put postage, you, they're not gonna mail it, right? Do you need a name? Are they gonna verify the name? Not necessarily. You could kind of put whatever you want. I don't think anybody's gonna check. Yeah, resident. Do you need an address? Yeah, it seems silly, right? But you think about what's necessary. If you don't have an address, they literally don't know where to deliver that mail. 
Uh, actually, a fun fact about the post office, I don't know if it's true anymore, but the legend was that, uh, especially in small towns, the post office person would know everyone in the town. So rather than specifying the exact address, if you didn't know the address, you could just put identifying details like uh, old man Ford's uh, ranch or something and it would get there. Or uh, you could say like the red house down by the big oak tree uh, by the river and they would like know who you're talking about and actually get the letter to you. Um, what about the people are mentioning return address? Do you need a return address? Or put another way, what's the point of a return address? Want one of you. First to raise their hand. Okay, sorry. Yeah, two reasons, right? One is if the post office has trouble delivering the letter, they can send it back to you. Why is that useful for you? So you know that it failed. You know that they didn't actually get your letter and you can try again. Maybe they'll say, hey, your description wasn't good or there's nobody at this address or the person moved, whatever. What's the second reason why you have a return address? So one's the post office. You wanna go to the other one? Yeah. If somebody wants to like, send a reply mail. Not just somebody, who specifically? The yes, the person I send the piece of mail to needs to know how to send it back to me, right? And that's why I return it. So if you don't care about a response, then who cares? if you have a correct return address, right? Um, oh, sorry. Here, we'll get this. All right. So we need something like this on the internet, right? We actually have a lot of the properties that we that we want, right? We we need an address because we need to know where to send data. It's exactly the same principle. We also need to know our address so that we know how they should send data back to us. And we actually have very similar mechanisms. If something happens along the way, there's actually mechanisms for the internet or one of the, more specifically, one of the switches along the way will send us back a note saying, hey, your packet got lost, sorry. Uh, it may also not, because what if that machine, you always have to think of the scenario, of what if my information, my packet was inside of a switch that was just unplugged, right? Good luck trying to get a uh, feedback on that. So, um, okay, we need, so everyone agree we need some sort of address? What's the problem with human addresses, with the addresses we use in the post office? Yeah, they don't, uh, who doesn't understand? Yeah, computers don't really understand physical addresses. They're not uniform. There can be crazy differences between uh, Fifth Avenue and Fish, Fifth Street. And if you don't maybe specify them, there can be ambiguities. So specifying exactly uh, which place is which is, uh, can be difficult. Uh, what else? And, yeah, lots of repetition in physical addresses, right? I don't really care. Does the post office care that you live on this specific street, right? They just care that they can deliver that data to you specifically. Cool. Yeah, distances between house numbers vary in a weird way. I actually have no idea how that works. It's probably fascinating. Um, cool. So in order to do that, we need an address. So we'll get into the specifics of what that is and how it works. For now, we just know that, hey, if we want to be on the internet, we need an IP address. If we don't have an IP address, we can't send data and we can't receive data. It just doesn't like, it'd be like, trying to, I don't know, send data from a place that the post office has no idea about and uh, it just is not going to work. You're never going to get your data. Uh, and so here, a network interface you could think of as, uh, you could have many, you could have a machine with multiple ethernet uh, cords, you could have a machine with two or three or four Wi-Fi adapters, uh, all kinds of craziness. So each host, so if you want to be a machine on the internet, you need an IP address. And you can actually have one or more, each uh, network interface can have one or more. And, okay, we're gonna be studying IPv4 because I think it's um, simpler. So IPv4 addresses have 32 bits. How many IPv4 addresses do we have? Possible, like theoretically possible. Two to the 32? 
How many is that? Yeah, roughly 4 billion. Is that enough? Seems really big. It seems like a large number. Would you like two to the 32 dollars? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the problem is we already have more than 4 billion people in the world, right? Uh, of course, maybe not. You could say not every person needs an IP address. Uh, but, but I think the device might have more than one IP. Address. Yes, devices could have more than one IP address, and people can have more than one IP address, right? Think about on you right now. You maybe have a laptop as at least one IP address. You probably have a cell phone which has an IP address. You probably have a. You may have a tablet which has an IP address, right? Uh, all these things have and need IP addresses. And so when you start multiplying these out, uh, you get kind of crazy. Uh, and actually, this is actually a big problem right now is we're, we've actually run out of IPv4 addresses. There's no, there's very little uh, available IPv4 address space. So it can cost a lot of money to get that. Um, but luckily, we've kind of sort of moved to IPv6. And there's a lot of reasons why you don't need to worry about it too much as a consumer, and we'll actually see exactly why. And so, uh, yeah, IPv6 addresses use not 64 bits, but 128 bits for addresses. So how many is that? Like a lot, a lot. Like, uh, it's hard to overstate how much that is. Something like more IP addresses than every grain of sand or something like that. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it is a lot. Uh, something like every atom could have its own IP address or something, IPv6 address. I don't know. You can, you can look it up and get all these kinds of stuff. So. <laughs> and so, okay, but we will uh, ignore that for now. We'll focus on 32 bits. And the way that we represent IP addresses so if you just had to think about IP addresses as a 32-bit number and say, oh yeah, I'm 10,052, or I'm a, a 1,560,064, uh, that would be kind of difficult and annoying. Um, and so the hu more human readable way that we uh, can do this is through a dot and decimal uh, notation. So this is basically taking those 32 bits of the IP address and splitting them up into eight bit chunks. So into bytes. So the uppermost byte is the first octet. So everything before the first dot can be zero to 255 in decimal. The second one, zero to 255. The third one, zero to 255. The fourth one, zero to 255. So much easier way. I'm sure you've actually, has anyone, has anyone not seen an IP address like this? What's maybe the most famous one that comes to mind? Yeah, 127001, which is in a special range. That means your local system. And actually, fun fact. Um, so yeah, 127001 is the local host. Um, many systems, well, Many systems may, so you can, there's exists a vulnerability in some websites and stuff where they go to fetch a website, but rather than making a web request to an external thing, you trick them into fetching from their local system, which maybe has admin functionality and all this other stuff. So a lot of places will block an IP address that looks like 127001. Uh, fun thing is a lot of um, uh, things will actually take the raw 32 bit number in decimal. So you can translate that to decimal and just request that and it will actually work. Um, it's kind of crazy. But uh, anyways, this kind of notation and representation thing is interesting. But the important thing for you is that these differences don't write. This is just a way to represent. It's like the difference between hex and decimal. Does it mean that the number we're talking about is different? Nope. What's the only thing that's different? Yeah, how we're choosing to present and discuss uh, those values. Cool. It's like different ways of placing the same dish. What was that? It's like different ways of placing the same dish. Yeah. So if I gave you a, an IP address in this dotted decimal notation, 
you'd be able to tell me like, yes, that's a valid address or no, that's an invalid address. And what, what would you use to figure that out? Yeah, so you check each octet and you'd see, is it between zero and 255? If you see 256 or higher, you know this is a bad IP address, it's not valid. Cool. All right. Now, what we're gonna get into here is we need to, to understand how data moves, we need to be able to understand and answer this question. Is this IP address in our local network or not? And so a, um, Yeah, so there actually be used to be a um, an early way of splitting up IP addresses into local and remote to say, okay, everything like everything that has the first three octets is in my local network, or everything that has the same first two octets or the first one octet is in my same network. Uh, it turns out that's a highly inefficient way of distributing uh, IP address space because your granularity is not very uh, great. So there's a system called CIDR, uh, classless interdomain routing that uh, does this. So blah, blah, blah. cool. So what we're going to do is specify this boundary. So to say what's a local network versus a uh, versus not, we can use a CIDR to specify this. So let me explain. And you can't see any of this. Cool. Okay. Well, this is annoying. Whoa. Mirror displays hold option while dragging. Jesus, could that be more confusing? Hello. All right. Okay. So what we need to decide is what's a local network and we're going to use basically CIDR notation for this. So the format here is you can think of as IP address and then a slash. So then some notion that says uh, where the split is. So I think this is best done by example. Can you read this in the back or you need me to make it bigger? Yes, I can. I hope so. I'm going to keep hitting buttons until something happens. Okay. So 192.168.0.1 slash 24. So we know this is an IP address, 192.168.0.1, right? Now the slash 24 says on the 24th bit, everything, I guess 24 bit, is that right? The higher 24 bits are part of the local network and the lower 24, the lower uh, 32 minus 24 would be eight. The lower eight bits are the hosts in that network. So what this means is, is uh, any IP address that starts with is in the local network, right? So a slash 24 means put a slash on the 24 at the 24th bit, right? And I picked 24 because it's now is very easy because all of this octet, all of this octet, all of this octet, these are all the uppermost bits. And so we say, okay, to this specific machine. So the other important thing is this is the machine configuration. So to be part of the internet, you need to not just know your IP address, you need to know where the split is and you need to know how to determine if things are on your local network or an external network. And there's a really important reason for that because if it's on our local network, we know we can just talk to it directly and we'll see that we can use a uh, link layer communications to do that. If it's on our uh, external network, we need to do other things to make sure it hops. 
So the other way to think about it is um, the link layer determines that first hop. How do we get something first to one hop? And then everything else determines how it goes further along. Cool. So if I say, okay, this is my, my, my machine's configuration. This is my IP address. This is my uh, network configuration. I could ask you a question like uh, is 192.168.1.1 local? How would you figure this out? What's the algorithm for this? Yep, this is still our thing. So we're gonna stick with this for right now, for example. Yeah, compare the higher 24 of ours, which is 192.168.0, with the higher 24 of here, do these bits match? No, it's not, right? And this is, again, it's all about this example, right? If I changed, if I now said our network split is 192.168.0.1 slash 16, now I could say is 192.168.1.1 local. Yeah, why yes? What's the algorithm, right? This is, you know, we're about developing how we do this, right? So I know the split is 16. I look at the top 16 bits here. I look at the top 16 bits here. And I say, yes, these are identical. These are exactly the same. So I'd say, yes, this is a local address, right? What if uh, I'm going to now, Now let's say it's 192.168.0.1 slash 17. And now we'd ask is 192.168.1.1 local? Why is this more difficult? Huh? Yeah, it's no longer byte chunks. So we can't just do it just by looking at the uh, octets here, right? I. Um, I mean, you kind of know because you could do it in your head. You could say um, it doesn't matter that it's an uneven split. The whole point of CIDR is you can put the split at any bit from uh, all the way, whatever this says, all the way from 13 to 27. So you could put it kind of anywhere within there. So yeah, so what, what you could do, right? You could just do this algorithm. There's a couple of ways. You could split it into hex, right? You could uh, translate each of those into hex. Actually, let's, and we could do that. So. I, don't, I can't just translate things into hex in my head. I'm sorry if I'm letting you down. Um, but we can look at our example, which is uh, OX uh, C0 and then uh, 168 uh, A8 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 1. And we could try this, uh, C0, A, 8, 0, 1, 0, 1. Now we can see this definitely makes sense because we know the split's somewhere in here, but we know that this uh, this uh, byte, is like, or this uh, nibble, I guess, half a byte is the same. These four bits are exactly the same. And we could even go further. Do I have it here? Uh, I guess I do. Yeah, I guess I, C0, A, 8, Zero, 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 0001. So we could, do we want to do it? Yeah, let's do it. This is always fun. Ah, all of your zooms. Okay. Wait, why is it D0? Okay, C, zero, A, eight, zero, 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 one. Right? If we were a computer, we could actually translate this down to binary. And zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one. And the other one is 
So we could just look at the top 17 bits if we were a computer. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, right? Luckily computers are way faster than I am at this in case you were wondering. And to make it even easier, I'm gonna put it next to it, right? Whoa, that's not right. You guys are supposed to check me on this. Let's go delete that. Right, and so you can say, "Yep, the first seventeen upper seventeen bits are the exactly the same." Right. Oh, I'm using the calculator. Just in case anyone wasn't clear, I'm using these bits right here. I did not do that by hand. Oh, I clicked on it. Oh, that's cool. Ah. Uh -huh. Look at that, I just learned something. You can click on the individual bits to change them. Oh, did you guys think I was just translating that into binary just by looking at the hex? Oh, I should just let you believe that. That would be great. <laughs> All right, no, I'm not a computer. Uh, so we can actually see the difference. You know, we could go out all the way. So we're at 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. It's only at the 23rd bit that it makes that it changes, right? And this makes sense because the only difference there is a zero and a one. Um, and let's see, I, uh, the other thing, 128. Yeah, so we can also ask, uh, so this we said, yes, this is local. And where this would change is, is uh, 192.168. 128.1 local. And the answer there should be no, because 128 has this highest uh, bit set, right? It's uh, 80. So it has the highest bit set of there. So that would change this bit from zero to one. I mean, I can show this. It will be exactly like this, except this will be one. And we'll say, nope, this is not local because that bit, these are different. Cool. So everyone agree that if you, you can calculate these to determine uh, is local versus is external addresses. By not saying anything, you agree that you can do this on a test. Okay, cool. Let me guess, you'll have to do this for a challenge. Yeah, you're demonstrating that you actually understand this stuff instead of just sitting here in class nodding. You know, that's why we have assignments and exams and stuff. I know it, it all seems arbitrary, but sometimes it has a purpose. Okay. Cool. So now that we can answer that really important question, right? We have we can answer this question. Is it local? Oh, and and this is not theoretical, right? So I just kind of um uh <laughs> This isn't just theoretical. Uh, yeah, so you can actually look at this on your network. Now it may be represented differently. So some systems you specify it in that CIDR like notation where you actually specify the IP address and then a slash with the net host boundary. Um, other systems like here right now on this network. Oh, you cannot see. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess I'll use my fun option trick. Jail back. Okay, so now that you can see it, and let me make this one finger. Okay, cool. So now that you can see this, we can see that my on this current system that I'm on, I'm on 10, 153, 17, 139. And my net mask here is, so the net mask is the other way um, of doing this. So FF, FFC, 000. So a mask, so uh, F, so this would be, let's see, the top, uh, definitely the top 16, right? So this FF, FF is all ones of 16 bits. And then C must be something uh, similar, let's see. C is the top two bits. So this is a 16, 17, 18. So what I'm on right now is a slash 18 in our terminology, 
Uh, everybody see how we went from this net mask to there? Okay, I'll show you one other system so we can see. Uh, I don't remember the other. Yeah. yeah, so here, this is again a completely different way of showing you the net mask, but it's exactly the same philosophy. These are going to be all bits. So 192.168.1.150.255.255.255.0, right? So my net mask, this would be a slash 24. Because in the net mask, all the bits that are one are are where your boundary is, and so you say, okay, this is a slash twenty four. So th this is the information that, as a machine on the network, you need to know. You need to know what's my IP address, and what's what's that network host boundary, so that I can tell what's in what's on our local network versus external. And this is exactly how we would do that. So this is why that question is uh, different depending on your network configuration, right? And that's why we went through this example and we looked that, hey, it depends based on your, your network config. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so the IP protocol is kind of one of the most important things. It represents essentially the glue of the internet. Yeah, okay, cool. So, it's kind of the layer right it makes sense we have ip addresses the thing is called basically the tcp ip stack right so we know if there's two hosts on the network we know that each host has its ip address and it has its um it has its uh, network host boundary so it knows how to say what's internal to its network or what's external now the IP protocol provides a connection list, unreliable best effort datagram delivery service where delivery integrity, ordering, non duplication, and bandwidth is not guaranteed. Whew. Sounds kind of crappy. Let's take it step by step. What does connection list mean? Uh, anybody know how the old phone systems worked? Have you ever seen, yeah, have you ever seen those pictures of people physically putting wires into systems to route calls? Do you know what they're actually doing? They're establishing a direct connection between one phone and another. So that way you can call the other phone and it rings and there's dedicated bandwidth in the phone network for that call because it's going over physical wires that nobody else is using. And so that's like a connection networking service. We have two systems and because that's what the operators are doing, right? They're plugging in and saying, oh, this person's phone needs to talk to this person's phone. And that's literally physically what they're connecting. Um, and that's how you literally call into the operator who would then route your call using that like physical method to wherever it was actually going. So that's a connection based service where you're building this physical connection between the two. Uh, we don't have that. There's no guarantee. There's no, you, there's no notion of a connection at the IP level. We'll do our best as we'll see to try to get data there, but, th but you're not building a dedicated connection to another system. Unreliable makes sense. We talked about it a lot, right? Machines get unplugged, uh, squirrels eat our cables. The IP level does not guarantee that your data will ever get there. Uh, best effort is also kind of another way of saying the same thing. Like, hey, we're going to try to get it there, but if things happen, tough luck. A datagram. What does a datagram mean here? Yeah, it just means uh, there's several different ways you can think about it, like packet or data. What this means is, and the connection list also means I'm not just sending a stream of data over IP with no end. I'm sending in an IP, as we'll see in an IP packet, I'm sending a fixed amount of data from one system to another. Okay, this seems really crappy. Why do we want this? So let's go back here. Shouldn't we just start over, rebuild the whole thing? Rip out this crap in the middle. That's not giving us any guarantees. It's like, why do we build our whole society on this stuff? Seems kind of crazy, right? Better off 
clearly there wasn't a better alternative. Uh, I disagree, and we'll see why. Um, they could have provided reliability here. They chose not to, yes, but why? Yeah. Because it abstracts away the flow or interface, so you don't need to rely on that to keep with it for the interface. Yeah, okay. Another way of thinking about it is so this is a way of thinking about it. you're building these stacks and these layers, right? Anything that you build into a lower layer, like reliability, right? If the IP level guaranteed, hey, if you give me a, a packet to send to another host on the internet, I will either guarantee you I will deliver that packet or I will guarantee you that I'll tell you that I couldn't, right? It could definitely do that. Everything above it has to pay that, not just pay the cost, but it has to support that or, or it's built in, right? Does every single application that you would want to run on the internet desperately need every packet to arrive? When are cases that you've used in your life where it's okay if a packet gets dropped? Right now, everyone on Zoom, would you even know if one frame of video is dropped from this call? And what if that one stream of video was dropped and now you had to get delayed seeing the rest of the video until it finally reappeared, maybe you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds later. How do you know how long to wait, right? These are all questions. And so not every, you know, Skype and voice is another thing. If you've even, uh, Zoom is pretty good about this if you pay attention. When their connection is bad, they'll kind of like drop and then they'll like get back on and they'll like compress everything that they were saying into something like really fast, so kind of catch up um but also you know random audio packets can be dropped and everything's fine so this is kind of a key design principle and this is what i want to call your attention to when building these kind of architectures it seems insane when you realize like the core of the internet does not provide these like reliability or any kind of things that we would want and that's because as we'll see higher levels do provide that actually technically tcp does and we'll see how that's done but not everything needs uh needs that so other things are games, right? So games, you have to synchronize state when you're playing multiplayer games, usually between a server and the clients. But if one packet is dropped, you don't want that to impact all the other update packets. You just update that, drop it fine, and then you keep going because you'll be much faster than if you did it without. Cool. Okay. And the core thing, the core concept here, is we can exchange IP datagrams between any two nodes on the internet as long as they both have an IP address. So again, just like we talked about in the post office, as long as you have an address, you can get data there. Okay, the other thing I want to uh, not freak out about is looking at uh, packets and information. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, protocols. So you should see this. Good, good, good. Uh, what is it? 7791. So if you want to find out how this stuff works, it's not hidden in secret, right? Actually, and this is one of the core things about things like networking protocols. Networking protocols have to be made so that other people can impl implement them. If it's not, then what are we doing? Like why, you know, if I have the networking thing, but I need you to build something to work with me, it's never going to work. So you can literally just go read the specifications. So um, uh, RFC is the request for comments, uh, which is a one way that standards get discussed and adopt, adopted. And you could go read this. You could um, like literally this, what I'm going to be presenting in the slides is just this information that exists in a text document. And yes, it is difficult to, you know, like it's a skill that you develop of reading these things, but you can figure out exactly how almost any protocol that you want works just by reading the documentation and the comments uh, and the uh, the docs and the uh, protocols. But I have a, a, obviously a nicer picture, so we'll start with there. Um, okay, so the very first thing in an IP datagram is four bits. So the way to read this is zero to 31. So these are we're thinking of these in 32 bit shock, uh, 32 bits, but of course it's just a stream of data, right? It's just one big long stream of data. We're just splitting it up visually. So the version is the first four bits. 
Why did they make the version be the first four bits? So yes, not close. You need to, you know how to interpret the next bits, right? You know, so that this way better, and this is a great, great um, example for uh, any protocol, right? The very first thing that you should read from that protocol is what version are you? This can make upgrades compatible. When you upgrade to IP version six, it's, all I have to do is read those first four bits. And now I know how to parse the rest of the packet and understand now it's an IPv6 packet. Whereas if I had other information, like for instance, if uh, IP addresses came before this version, I would, I would have to interpret them normally, right? I can't upgrade anything that happens before that, that version packet. Um, HL, I believe is header length. Uh, there's actually a lot of things or some things in here that aren't really used. Um, so I won't go into super in depth here. The total length is uh, 16 bits that I believe represents how many bytes are in the totality of this IP packet. Um, and ID and identifier, uh, I think we'll get into some of this stuff. Uh, flags, fragment offset, um, time to live is actually a really important um, thing. So think about this, we're sending data into the network What's to prevent like uh, one machine says, okay, give so machine, uh, let's say switch A says, okay, I get this packet, I send it to switch B. Switch B says, oh, I get this packet, I send it to switch C. Switch C gets this packet and says, oh, great, I send it to switch A. What happens to that packet? Loops infinitely. It just literally stays around in the network forever until uh, either one of the packets, or one of the switches happens to drop it because it's full and has memory constraints or it literally just loops forever. So to prevent that from happening, there's a time to live packet, which every hop along the way is decremented. And once it reaches zero, it's dropped and, and people, the switches don't carry it on anymore. Uh, this actually has really interesting uh, debugging capabilities. I think we'll look at it later. If you've ever used something like traceroute, uh, this is actually how it works and how it figures out the hops and everything. Uh, a protocol <coughs> is actually interesting because it uh, has information about the lower level or the uh, upper level protocols. Uh, a checksum. So a checksum will look at the header and make sure that it matches uh, some value. I believe it's like, must be like CRC 16, I think. Then we have, of course, the source IP address, the destination IP address, some options and padding so that it's uh, at a fixed offset. And then the data below. So what's gonna be in this data? Or does, I guess the other way to phrase that, does the IP level care what's in that data? No. No, and that's the point. As we'll see, it could be a TCP packet, it could be an IP packet, like, or sorry, it can't be an IP. The UDP Probably can't. Yeah, it could be TCP, UDP. It could be something brand new that we built on top of it, but we don't care because all our job is to do is to get this data from one machine to the other. Cool. <coughs> okay. Let's see. Is there anything else? Oh, uh, yeah. So the header checksum is interesting because. Um, you can actually have problems in transmission where bits get flipped, right? Uh, because again, we know this is traveling over some physical mediums. And so there's actually a number of different ways. Now, the, the difference between a checksum and a hash, right? Can a hash be used to detect if bits have been flipped? Why not? I hash this header and the, everything else except for this. If I hashed it and then put the hash value in here, could you check and verify that no bits were flipped? Not really. Why not? Because it's inconsistent. It uses a mathematical equation to basically compress the full value into a small to a much smaller. Entry. Sure, and but but if you flip one range. bit, is the hash going to be different? Yeah. And then you can check that and detect. But so, is, you know, you have, uh, multiple um, starting points that would get the same index. The odds of finding that though depend on the size of your hash, right? So with a 16-bit hash, you could brute force 
all the two to the 16, but I'm not talking about a attacker doing this. I'm talking about a random bit flip in transmission, right? So you could do that. I mean, also the attacker would control this hash so they could just recompute the hash and put it there, right? If they want to change something. Uh, anyways, the reason why you don't do that is because uh, it, it's more expensive to do that. So the cryptographic operation for a checksum or they're not cryptographic operations. The math operations for a checksum are much uh, easier and more efficient. So that's actually why we don't have hashing uh, in here at this level. Yeah, the goal is to catch like random bit flips, not uh, anything crazy. Uh, okay, that, cool. So as we'll see, the, so we're going to have kind of, so we can think of the IP packet as we have this header that we just looked at with the format and everything. We have the data. And then as we'll see, this will go inside an ethernet uh, frame, which is the link layer. And we'll look at that next. So the way to think about that is from the ethernet perspective, it's going to have its own header. And then it's going to have this data. And that data happens to be an IP packet. So this is how you kind of get when you're thinking about data moving along a network, you have this kind of like onion layers of different headers. You usually first have the, if it's an ethernet packet, you'll have the ethernet header frame. And then in that frame data, you'll have the IP header. And then in the IP data, you'll have the TCP header. And then in there you'll have the uh, application data, which may itself have headers, right? But the point is each layer only has to worry about its stuff. Like, okay, cool. So what we're going to look at now, so we, so what we're going to look at is IP direct delivery. So direct, direct delivery means the two hosts are on the same network. How do we know that they're on the same network? When I say the same network, I mean the same, they're on the same local network. What was that? Yeah, we can look at the IP address and the netmask, right? Or the CIDR, uh, however we want to do that. But just exactly what we did, right? The computer does precisely identical to what we did, just very fast, much faster than, than we can do it. And it says, are we on the same local network? If yes, then I can use IP direct delivery. So uh, on this example, so sub uh, sub network is the same as the netmask. So saying like, okay, the top, this would be a slash 24. So 111, 10, 20 is my uh, network. I have two machines, one as 111, 10, 20, 121. And the other thing we're going to look at in a second is I need actually a different type of address of a physical address. And so that is what we'll look at is MAC addresses. And so Basically, we're going to study and look at how does a packet, if I want to send it from 111, 10, 20, 121, I want to send it to 111, 10, 20, 14. A, I know by checking my uh, network information that yes, this is a local address, meaning I can do IP direct delivery. And then I'll, we'll show how that data actually moves on the local network. But to do that, we need to first look at the ethernet frame. So this data is in bytes. So uh, at the physical, well, no, no, sorry. At the link level, ethernet addresses are six bytes and they're typically represented in hexadecimal as we've seen. So the destination source, the type, and then data is actually a very simple uh, protocol. And then actually a checksum also itself at the end, there's that, that's why I said there's multiple checksums and multiple layers. Uh, the different types are for um, ARP or reverse ARP, but we'll look at those in a second. And so good, we got plenty of time. All right, so ethernet is one of the most widely used link layer protocols. This actually does not mean like necessarily physical, like like uh, ethernet cables. I actually don't know why they're, the names are interlinked because your Wi-Fi has like ethernet frames built on top of it. So, um, so addresses in at the, the link layer are 48 bits. And they're typically represented in hexadecimal separated by colons. So here, 0945 FA 07 22 23. These are, this is a physical address. There's actually a, um, some kind of a schema that you can go look up. 
uh, that different network card manufacturers will have different prefixes. So you can actually go look up uh, what those are. Uh, do we, now this is kind of an important thing. Do we need to worry about global collisions? Like how can we have a run out of ethernet addresses? Huh? I said, have we? So, so is your claim that there are too many devices and we have run out of Ethernet addresses? Yeah. It's not true. Why not? We can recycle addresses and why? How come my Ethernet address here can or can't conflict with maybe some some place in Google happens to have the same one. Local. It's local. Thank you. Who is that? Yeah, it's a local address. It only means it's only significant inside my local network. <coughs> I will fundamentally never know Google's Ethernet addresses unless I'm on their local network and Google has a big problem at that point. Right. So this is actually why. And again, this is part of what I'm trying to get you to think about. This is why IP addresses we need much more because IP addresses have to be public and you have to know somebody's IP address in order to communicate. Whereas I don't know and I won't ever know anyone else's IP address that's not on my local, or sorry, I won't know anybody's MAC address that's not on my local network. Yeah. My question is with the IP address system, why don't they just set it up that way a network has a MAC IP address and then there's a separate index for like some device on MAC? Uh, say that again. So the like the, I, the normal thirty three IP address mm -hmm. instead of referencing a device on the internet, it represents a network connected to the internet, and then attached to that thirty two IP address would be like index to represent whatever device was. Yes. It. Okay, that's a good question. It you it was kind of built that way. So from the start. So that's the thirty two bit IP address was separated into different classes where the first octet was the network and the rest indexed a specific device. And the other type of classes were the first two octets were the network and the last two octets were the device. And then the last, the first four and then the last four. But that's not a big enough granularity was the problem. So that actually is the core problem uh, because you, you do need like part of your IP address specifies your network and part of it specifies your machine inside that network. So you actually can think of it that way. The problem is they only use 32 bits for both of those rather than using, like you said, 32 bits for the size of the network maybe, and then 32 bits for the host or something. But then the problem is then every network would be capable of having <coughs> two to the 32 hosts, which you don't really need that in a lot of cases. So anyways, there's a lot, all kinds of trade-offs. And that's why IPv6 bumped it up to yes. 128. Exactly. So you can have, and I think it's the same principle where you can put that split wherever you want. So you can have as large of an internal network as you want with many devices. Cool. Okay. Uh, interesting thing that we'll kind of note here and put it in our brain for later is that the maximum size of an ethernet frame is 1500 bytes. Okay. The first thing that we need to know, actually, I hate stopping early. I want to give you your money's worth. You know. um, so remember the, the, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to send an IP packet from one machine to the other. And the only thing I know about the destination machine is the IP address. But if it's on my local network, I need to send it physically on Ethernet and I need to know their MAC address, right? Because otherwise I can't send them at the link layer to where it needs to go. So we need to have some kind of protocol to translate between the two, and that is ARP. So ARP is the protocol that translates between IP addresses and Ethernet addresses. So again, check yourself. Can I make an, does it make sense to make an ARP request to like google.com to get their MAC address? Why? Uh, security, basically. No. What was it? They're not, local. They're not local. I have no use for their MAC address, right? So ARP is, by the principles we just talked about, only available on your local network. And we'll see kind of how exactly that works. 
Um, it does have nice security principles, but that's not the fundamental reason why. Cool. All right. There we are. 10.15. We'll come back. And Thursday, we'll get digging into our...